It is now my great pleasure to introduce you all to three very special people uh, to address a set of issues and topics that I think are relevant to all of us in our work. Our keynote conversation, Rising Above It All, A Tale of Leadership Succession. So joining us are Sharisa Zapata Walker, who's the engagement manager for the Boston Waterfront Initiative at the Trustees. She's also the project manager for Southern New England Farmers of Color Coalition and a strategic consultant at Two Aspire Consulting. Teresa is also a valuable member of FINE's Network Advisory Council and the Farm to Institution Steering Committee. And Teresa will be moderating the conversation today with Angel Mendez and Michael Rosine. Angel is the executive director at Red Tomato, and Michael is Red Tomato's founder and evangelist. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of all of these folks, and I have to say that I'm incredibly excited um, that you all are joining us today. So, Teresa, I'm going to take off my fine hat, put on my red tomato hat, and hand it over to you to, uh, to take it from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, so we're gonna start. Welcome everyone. So Red Tomato is a food hub based in Providence, Rhode Island. In fact, their offices are in the very farm fresh Rhode Island building. We will be convening live in next week for the in-person gathering of this fine summit. Red Tomato works with 40 fruit and vegetable growers in the Northeast and markets their aggregated produce to supermarkets and institutions. Their two main programs are bypassed and eco-certified both of which will be highlighted in this panel discussion. Now that we have some context of the work that Red Tomato does, let's start the story at a very critical point of the organization. Let's start with the title, Rising Above It All, A Tale of Leadership Succession. So what is the all that you are rising above? Can you set the stage for us? Sure, thanks, Charissa. Good morning, everyone. The all that we're rising above were the hard times of 2018 and 2019, a low point in the history of Red Tomato. The leadership transition that led to me taking over in 2019 actually began in 2014 and 2015. It was an intentional and well-planned board staff process, which a courageous and very talented Red Tomato employee, Laura Edwards Orr, was asked to become an executive director when founder Michael Rosine stepped down and into another role. Laura accepted and led us for four years. In 2018, the organization hit a wall of sorts. We lost a significant customer all at once, which amounted to 40% loss of sales. Other customer relationships were being challenged by mergers and acquisitions, and buyers we knew too well had left their jobs. The halo over locally grown was beginning to fade, at least in the supermarkets. And in the course of six months, we lost half our staff. At the end of 2018, Laura resigned as executive director. I stay in touch with Laura. We make sure we connect several times a year. When I told Laura I was working on this presentation for, fine, for the FINE conference, she said to me, I had always thought of my part of the role as Red, Red's ED was being a bridge to the next leader. The challenge of that moment required new leadership, and that was something I recognized and needed to honor. We all know that managing a nonprofit is difficult. We have faced hardship, but this one felt like we had dropped to our knees. I recall looking at Michael as I felt the sinking, and I said to myself, this feels like the Titanic, but I'm staying on board. By this point, I had given Red Tomato 18 years of my life. And understanding that our work is never ending, it was vital to me that Red Tomato continue to support food systems work for years to come. I envisioned myself on a deck or a porch in the future, drinking some good coffee and reading about the new Red Tomato team, continuing to stir things up. It means the world to me. Wow, from how you describe things, Angel, it was clear that critical change is needed to happen in order to see the future you envision come to life. 
Michael, can you tell us more of what these changes look like and why they were important? Well, if there was any silver lining in that dark cloud over 2018, it was really being forced to look at ourselves more honestly than we had been. We believed that a good relationship with a supermarket buyer was the key to success. And that success meant getting our growers' products into stores, onto shelves, and labeled local so that shoppers, consumers, eaters could see them and identify them. But what we were forced to see in 2018 and 19 was the changes that were happening out there in the industry, the mergers, the acquisitions, the relationships leaving, people becoming less accessible, and relationships heading downhill. All that was a picture of the future. So what happened next at Red Tomato is what we refer to as the pivot. We had to pivot away from this sense of buyer-manager relationship at the center of everything. And we had to direct our communication toward the eaters. We had to learn how to do that, how to create direct communication. So in no way are we saying those buyer relationships are unimportant or even less important. It just meant that if we're going to be here and serve our growers, we have to communicate differently. So we're practicing that pivot now in all sorts of ways. That's great. So we started this story right when the organization was in a crisis of sorts, and you found ways to pivot and transform how you were doing things in the organization. But let's go back now to where it all began. Can you tell me more about the value of Red Tomatoes mission and your origin story that led us right up to this critical point in 2018? Sure. So some of you may know Red Tomatoes mission is to connect farmers and eaters through marketing, trade, education, and collaboration. Our core purpose is to create opportunities for our region's farmers to become primary suppliers of a sustainable regional food system. Initially, we had to market to buyers to get them to understand how, how, to, better, how, how to better buy locally uh, grown food, food from the field, uh, not inventory from a cooler. There was much to educate buyers on, such as local varieties, uh, color, weather impacts, standing order. But if there was an earthquake at Red Tomato in the early days that was anything as consequential as 2018, it was in 2002 when we decided to give up our warehouses, trucks, and drivers and operate as a distributor without assets. We became logistics and marketing managers, still buying from farmers, selling to customers, and coordinating every step along the supply chain. It was costing us tons of money, taking our attention away from farmers and putting it on fundraising and acquiring new assets. And what we got from that was agility and the ability to operate with far less work and capital. At the end of 2002, Red Tomato went from a bricks and mortar operation to what the industry calls a non-asset based operation. You might ask, what, no coolers, no warehouse? How does that work? Well, for starters, we had to lay off truck drivers and the warehouse staff. I'm the lone survivor from those days. <laughs> I moved into the office to run logistics. Then we leased our warehouse space to another company. After that, we pared down our product offering and focused on what we did best. From 2003 onward, we taught ourselves to operate supply chains without the assets. Internally, we spoke of two kinds of supply chains. Plan A, which was farm to wholesale, aggregating many farms products into large loads that went into distribution centers known as DCs. There was also plan B, which was farm direct to retail or direct store door delivery, better known as DSD. Finding reliable and affordable truckers was one of the hardest things about the new model. Each supply chain requires a different solution. For this, we turned to farmers first and then to independent trucking companies. And our creative art director, Diane Rass, and director of marketing, Sue Futrell, meanwhile worked hard at telling our farmers' stories through packaging and point-of-sale work. 
being much smaller than our competitors and by mixing different farm products and packaging together in a single delivery by choice and by design, we became experts at inefficiency. <laughs> I learned to pay a whole lot of attention to what I now call ease of business, doing absolutely everything in the way of customer service and logistics to make things more efficient, cheaper, and easy as possible for growers and customers. Red tomato grew around 20% annually from 2003 to 2008 as local, took off, as local took off in popularity. By 2015, we were doing 5 million in top line sales and had built up cash reserves to support our future fiscal health. And then we began to feel the rumblings of changes in the marketplace. Wow, that's really fascinating. So Michael, Angel just described some of the big operational changes you made over the years, but a big part of this pivot ties into this ecological story of the importance of our regional apple production. Tell us more about this and the changes you enacted after Angel stepped into the role of executive director. So the pivot started with apples, and that's because first apples are core to farm to institution, pun intended. They're available year round, all institutions, schools, hospitals, prisons, cafeterias, they all offer apples and many of them want them to be local. As one national farm to school leader said to me, apples often show up as the visual symbol of our farm to school network. And it's often the first product that a group focuses on when they start operations. Well, apples are also core to red tomato. It's our number one product line and in our signature program, Eco Certified, um, Eco Certified Apples and Peaches, the eco farmers use some very cool earth friendly practices to protect bees and to control the critters that harm their fruit. All of this limiting their use of chemicals. Let me take you into the weeds of just one such ecological practice called mating disruption. Stay with me here. Coddling moths are among the worst enemies of an apple tree. When it's time for mating, a female coddling moth emits a stream, a fine spray like a perfume to attract the male moth. But if the farmer sends out an imitation of the perfume, a larger dose, it totally messes with the brains of the male moths and they can't find the female and they can't mate. I love that. I love the details of why everything works, but can you tell me in one sentence why your moth story is so important to the overall story? Sure. Without this cool technology mating disruption, then either the moths go ahead and consume the whole crop or the farmer has to spray chemicals to stop them. So pivoting at Red Tomato in this moment had to start with Eco Certified Apples, our number one product line. If we were going to master direct communication with eaters, then we had to be able to explain in 20 seconds why Eco Apples are special. Huh. Well, that ought to be easy, right? wrong. In fact, it was really hard. Even when I do my best job telling that eco story, inevitably, the listener looks up and says, oh, so those apples are organic, right? For many people, that's the only filter they have for understanding farming. Is it organic or not? Well, after a hundred such interactions, I threw my hands up in the air and I said, I have got to better understand how human brains work. How are mental models fixed in people? Can they change? Why is it that science and facts just don't seem to matter? So here are the facts that I thought would help make the case for eco. Organic apples are extremely hard to grow at a commercial scale in our region. That's because our climate is so wet and humid 
which attracts an onslaught of insects and diseases that they don't have to cope with out in the far west. About 95% of all the organic apples grown in the US come from the state of Washington. Let me say that a different way. In Washington, the number one apple state, there are 27,500 organic acres. That's about 16% of Washington's apple acres. Here nearby in New York state, the number two apple state in the US, there are 150 organic acres. That's one third of 1% of New York's apple acres. So in order to tell this eco story, we essentially had to create another category. In addition to organic and not organic, we introduced ecologically grown or eco-certified. Our headline is eco-certified is where local and sustainable come together. I love that. So Michael, why not build the story entirely around local? It already had a popular way you know, for the market and the consumer, why complicate the story? So why complicate is a great communication question. But the reason that we tell the story as both local and sustainable together is that by focusing only on local, the story often default, defaults to being a hyper-local story about very small farms, which leaves scale and volume and the mid-sized growers we work with out of the picture. Yeah, direct marketing through farmer's markets, CSA's farm stand, that is truly as good as it gets in terms of introducing the public to farmers. And yet, all those direct markets, their sales put together amounts to about two to 5% of national produce sales. Meanwhile, in stores and institutions where the other 95% of produce is sold and consumed, produce is increasingly imported from the West and from outside the country. Meanwhile, our local growers and the popular varieties like Macintosh are falling out of the store and off the shelf. Let, let me flip this actually into a call for action and a call for help. We're now recruiting more growers, more customers. We're recruiting artists to help us shape this story so it has emotional impact. And we really need more food hubs to work with, more NGO partners to help us distribute, promote, and tell this story. If you'd like a bite of this apple, if you'd like a piece of this action, please reach out to us after the summit. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, Angel, Michael just described a key component in understanding why we needed to go beyond our understanding of organic and value of being eco certified. But tell us more of another critical shift in the organization, the bypass story. Sure, thanks. As a Latino growing up, as a Latino growing up in the inner city of Boston in a low income household and a community, I experienced what it's like to be on the other side of the fence. I have also been blessed to work and learn more about food, small farm operation economics, and the importance and many powers of connecting these two communities and how food connects all. By 2019, we hit a wall and concluded we couldn't continue business as usual. It's getting harder to work with the supermarkets. So then we thought, how about if we bypass the conventional marketing system and connect growers to communities with as little infrastructure in the middle? That is where Red Tomatoes operating principle is. We knew that this idea was not new. In fact, organizations were actively working on this in various community food distribution models throughout the US. Understanding the importance of food sovereignty in these communities, we decided to pilot collaboration with local growers that we work with in Connecticut, Connecticut community food distributors, and Red Tomato to work in collaboration increase in poll order volumes, remove costs, pay fair prices to local farms, and deliver fresh local food to consumers at fair and affordable and accessible prices. We hired a consultant, 
Ian Prinsloo from a global strategic advisory firm named Rios Partners to support us with methods for effective collaboration. In 2020, we convened a group of Connecticut farmers and two to three community food distributor groups from the low-income communities of Bridgeport and Hartford, Connecticut. I had been waiting and anticipating this moment for quite some time, given my experience in both communities the synergies to be attained by collaborating felt powerful and meaningful to me. My work and the food systems change that all parties involved have been fighting for. As we began to explore synergies together in that meeting, I remember being unable to hold back the tears of joy rolling down my cheeks as I listened closely. I have always described these tears as joy pain tears as they come with a little bit of both. Always a joy for what is possible and a pain for not getting there sooner. Throughout 2023, we have continued the collaboration, building trust, learning from one another, and ensuring the process is equitable for all involved. It has been an amazing journey, and I'm proud to be a part of such an important endeavor. We have achieved so much in what we believe is the first of many steps in creating a new food system that is equitable, accessible, and sustainable. Thank you. I'm noticing that you both talk freely about serious problems and failures that you have survived. It makes me wonder more about your personal stories. What is it about your upbringing that set you on a path to lead Red Tomato to handle all the pressure and be able to bounce back and persist when things don't go right, to rise above it all as your book title indicates? No. I grew up in the inner city of Boston, raised by a single mom, Olga Ramos, 75 today, my older brother, Hector, and me. I grew up in a low-income household in the small Boston housing development, so I've known them as the projects. Growing up in this environment, there are a lot of qualities that you pick up fast. They're for survival. What I didn't know back then was how much these qualities were actually skills that would serve me years later. For example, keeping my head on swivel it comes naturally. Being aware of surroundings, not just the environment, but people and personalities. I had to watch my back at all times. Today, this, is a, this powerful tool allows me to be attentive and keep my eyes on everything going on at work, but also pay close attention to the personalities and work styles of my team members, aiming to position them and support them so they can contribute the most to be creative and get the most out of their work at Red Tomato. I love my team. To help others in need. When we were young, all my friends loved eating at our house. My mother told my brother and me never to deny anyone a plate of food. She always taught us to help those in need, lift them up, and never make fun or take advantage of someone in need or someone who has less. This is why I lead with love and heart. It's no fun doing good by yourself. I always want my friends to party with me. Another thing I learned is hustling hard and playing harder. Knowing that the benefits, the gratification comes after the hard work. Growing up with less kept me hungry, hungry to hustle harder, hungry to hustle harder for greater gratification while being conscious of taking care of myself. It's like that, you know, put the oxygen mask thing on yourself first. <laughs> if I'm not strong, I cannot help others. My mom also taught us about sacrifice. That was like my early lesson in economics, that we would have to forego some things to have others. We could not have it all. We learned early the importance of sacrifice. Also in the environment I grew up in, it was important to have no fear. Growing up where I did, I trained myself to have no fear as this would be recognized as a weakness. At Red Tomato, I used this tool to persevere and keep moving forward when I doubted myself or when others are doubting me. I think back on anxiety I felt early on the job at Red Tomato as a person of color doing this work in the early 2000s. I didn't see many others who looked like me. I was in my early 20s. At times, I felt like everyone was out to get me. My food system journey felt painful at times. I had to process a lot. I made mistakes. I cried, but I learned and I persevered. 
always trying to move forward with love, big heart. At times when I was ready to give up, the good Lord whispered, I put you here to carve a path for others like you. If you leave now, they win. So back into the ring I went, feeling that joy pain. It's a part of me. My upbringing shaped who I am today. It taught me to never take things for granted and to always give my best. It taught me to have a strong work ethic and to never give up on my dreams. One more thing about me is somewhere along the way, I realized that I'm a systems thinker. I come by it naturally. It's how I solve problems and I love solving problems. I love exploring how different components of a system interact with each other and how small changes in one area can have a cascading effect on the entire system. I'm also passionate about finding solutions to problems that are both efficient and effective. I'm constantly striving to understand the underlying principles of a system and to identify patterns that can be used to improve things in the way that I work. I believe that understanding the complexity was the complexities of a system is the key to making progress. And that progress is possible when we have an understanding of the entire system. Hmm. Wow. Hey, Teresa, this is obviously a pretty deep question you threw at us. Like I <laughs> I think everybody in the room at this summit should be asking themselves this question. As for me, I, I do think about this, and but I hardly ever talk about it out loud. So here goes. It, it of course, goes back to my parents for sure, but, but not so much in an obvious way. From my mother, I gained the confidence, some social skills, and the chutzpah to lead. She influenced my, my being by, by her being so totally present in my upbringing. My father influenced me by being so totally absent. Like Angel, I was raised by a single mom. I was her only child. It was really, it was just the two of us. My mother Edie is still alive today. She's 92. In the 1960s, she was a nursery school teacher working for her mentor, Jeannie Ginsberg. Once on a red tomato business trip to New Jersey, I dragged Angel and Laura Edwards Orr, parents of young children at the time, both of them, over a lunch to meet Jeannie Ginsberg, my mother's mentor. I asked Jeannie to explain her philosophy about teaching three and four year olds. And she said, well, it's rather simple. It all comes down to listening and observing who the child is. Every young person is unique. Everyone has different needs. And by the time they're three, the whole person, the future person can be seen. And once you know who they are, a teacher or a parent can effectively raise and teach that child. Well, by that philosophy, my mother raised me with a lot of help from her two sisters and from my grandmother. I had a suburban middle-class upbringing in North Jersey except I felt none of those pressures that a lot of my friends felt in their families, you know, like be a doctor, be a lawyer, make a lot of money, got to go to graduate school. I had none of that. Like my mother never said anything in words like, I want you to be the best version of who you truly are. She never said that, but that's what it felt like growing up under her. And I'm forever grateful to my mother for all the attention and the love she gave me. My father, Yecheskel, was born in Poland. And during World War II, in his early 20s, he joined the Polish resistance, the underground. He was captured by the Nazis and sent to the concentration camp Auschwitz, and then went on to Dachau. He survived, and he was liberated by American military forces in 1945, and then immigrated to Israel around 
1947. My mother actually also has a Holocaust background. Her family fled Germany and lived in Holland and then made their way to the US in 1939. They settled in Northern Jersey. Um, in the 50s, after graduating from college, my mother went to Israel where she met my father. They fell in love and decided that they'd stay in Israel and raise a family. But my father died of a heart attack when I was six months old. He was 39. So I never knew my father. I have his bushy eyebrows, his receding hairline, his smile and his sense of humor, so they tell me. But his absence left a hole in my life, kind of a place that's rather lonely and searching. It's a place that to this day, I, I don't fully understand. In my mid twenties, I became hungry to fulfill his life story or to get his life story, which I did assemble from various uncles and aunts and cousins who knew him during the wartime. But the facts and stories about his life don't fill that large hole. So resilience is a large part of my family's story. I carry a picture of my father's face in my mind. And when I face really, really hard times, I give myself a talking to, and I say, hey, your father was able to survive Auschwitz and Dachau. You can figure this one out. Thank you both for sharing. I feel like every time I hear your stories, I get so emotional and I think there's so much about your story that I can relate to. And I just feel honored that you guys were able to share that with us. And um, thank you so much. I was like getting emotional, like, and I've heard this story already. So thank you for sharing. Um, since you seem comfortable speaking personally about the big challenges, I like to probe further into this tale of leadership succession. There's a whole lot of leadership transitions going on in our food system world, on farms, and in organizations. The literature on founder successions and nonprofits is full of cautionary tales, and it offers some examples that are more encouraging. So what's been your experience as close to the unvarnished truth as you feel comfortable sharing? Well, you might be surprised to know that there's a whole section in that leadership literature dedicated to how to make a founder succession work in nonprofits. That's what got my attention. Apparently, thousands of nonprofits every year face the daunting task of replacing their long-serving founders. And there's a warning that comes that comes it with, with that. Make a clean break. Founders and succession, founders and successors are like managerial oil and water. They just don't mix. Ouch, whoa, that doesn't sound very promising for the rest of my career. Actually, I'm rather amazed that after 25 years at Red Tomato, this work still feels interesting and challenging. You know, when, when friends throw that retirement word at me, I throw back something that I learned from my coworker, Alessandra's father, Bob Cancelosi who spent his career as a leadership coach. He told me that the stage I'm in is called rewirement. <laughs> it was winter 20, it was the winter of 2019 when I accepted the post of executive director. I had a pretty good sense of what being an ED of Red Tomato meant. I'd been here for almost 20 years. But the truth is nobody knows how big the job is until you're doing it. I'd been director of finance and operations, but I'd never done the fundraising or marketing or trade, and I needed Sue and Michael's help to manage these areas. What I underestimated was how hard it would be to do this job with the founder in the office every day. <laughs> I felt pulled in the opposite directions. Some days I'd be thinking, I have to keep Michael here as long as I can. I need him to lead trade and development until new staff are ready to take over so I can focus on operations, finance, and marketing. Other days I'd be thinking, it's too hard. How do I establish myself as a leader of this organization with the founder here? People see, people see him as the ultimate decision maker. They seek his approval of head of mind. And then I'd sink into this emotional rabbit hole. Is this real? Or am I just imagining it? 
and I'm definitely feeling it. Well, somewhere in the middle of that rabbit hole, I had a significant breakthrough. I'm an emotional person and I always will be, but I have to manage this organization around outcomes, systems, and processes and not, my emo and not let my emotions get the best of me. They matter and they inform my problem solving process. But I have, I have to keep these emotions, I, but I have to keep my focus on the outcomes. And I have been practicing that ever since. What's really impressive to me, Angel, is, is that you found a way to share all about what you were going through with me while it was happening. I suppose you were able to trust me because of how much we've been through together. There was that Friday end of day ritual that we established a long time ago. At the end of the Friday, we were the last two in the shop and we would set up everything for the weekend business, checking all the paperwork, looking for and finding mistakes and imagining everything that could possibly go wrong. <laughs> yeah, and now in our Friday end of the week meetings, we don't review the paperwork anymore. We've made a space for where we can talk turkey. If I hadn't been able to say the stuff to you directly and point out those situations where I felt my authority undermined by something you did or said, in a meeting or in the in the space in the office if you weren't able to see it you know you know angel the hardest thing the hardest thing for me has been knowing when to be in the game totally in the game like a full participant at the table or when to get out of the way so that you and my other co-workers can figure things out on your own it's like either way if i do it poorly too in or too out it screws things up for you and for my coworkers. it's a good thing angel that we resurrected those friday meetings so that we can process all this stuff while it's still fresh yes and it takes more than that one of the best decisions we made was hiring jeremy seligman our executive coach he's been amazingly helpful over the past couple of years and so has the executive committee of our board. I get support from a lot of places. So you've been ED for like four plus years now and Red Tomatoes in a pretty good place. If we dare say this leadership transition is working, well, yeah, there are many different reasons why. But I think the main reason is you. From the day I met you, You've been a learning machine. You never slow down learning and processing all the time. You do it at a cultural level. You do it at a business level. You do it at a human psychological level. And you've got a solid core. Like you really know who you are. Thank you, Michael. I remember you said back to me in 2019, It'll take two years to figure out how to do the job. And then you got to figure out how to enjoy the job <laughs> and even have some fun. I didn't understand that at the time. <laughs> Today, I get it. I'm definitely having fun at times, like when I'm mentoring food hub leaders in other parts of the country or working on growing justice in food systems in low income communities. And the way you lead makes it possible for me too to keep on doing creative work that I love. And I'm really grateful about that. The way you listen, support my leadership and continue to share your knowledge, insights, creativity, and breadth of experience keeps me learning and learning is fun. It's what I love. <laughs> For example, you introduced me to Brene Brown's TED Talk on vulnerability, and that made things even more fun. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure you realize how much our relationship means to me. I met you in 2001 when I started working as warehouse manager. I would come into the building in my street attire, a white, a white tee, black jeans, and Timberland boots. I had always experienced being judged or underestimated due to my appearance. 
one of the main qualities that I grew that I grew to love and trust in working with you is that you never judge me. It felt surreal to work with and for someone who believed in me, trained me, listened to me, and pushed me to be better, to think hard, to take more risks, to venture into the unknown. Michael, you've been more than a boss to me. You've been a role model, a mentor, and a friend. And by the way, <laughs> you also have a pretty good sense of humor too, which some days is just what I need. Wow. Them's kind words, Angel. That, that means a whole lot to me. Thank you. Actually, what we're doing here is not magic or even, or, or even all that unusual. That warning about making a clean break, it turns out it's a myth. When I dug into the data, it says that many of the more successful founder transitions have the founder staying around in some way, a quarter of them in a significant role. It just takes a whole lot of intention and attention and planning. Well, I have another question for you. So how would you describe what your leadership looks like now versus what it was 10, 15 plus years ago? How has it evolved and what are some lessons that you've learned? And that's for me. <laughs> yeah. Either I could, one can answer. I could jump in, Michael, you could come after. But yeah, I... I think for me, one of the biggest lessons I learned, I think I mentioned it in here, was really around having to remove, uh, you know, having to remove personal emotion and focus on, on, on outcomes and processes and kind of focus on the system. Because I really understand that everybody comes into this work with their own worldview, their own way of seeing the world. And those things could get in the way of the way we make our decisions or the way we make assumptions and the way we see things at work on a day-to-day -day basis. And they can make it really hard for us, especially if you come from different, totally different backgrounds. And so that has been one of the biggest tools in, in my process and which has really allowed me to be working here side by side with Michael. When, when those times feel really tough, I'm able to humble myself and say, okay, what are we after here? It's not about my credit. It's not about me. It's not about, oh, the founders there, they're looking up to them, but are we going to where we're going? And if that's happening, then I've got to kind of humble myself and step back and say, and then on the other side of that, it feels really good. Oh, reassurance. This is what to do. But it's still really hard. And so it's kind of that ongoing back and forth battle, but gratification for watching us kind of continue to move the dial. Hmm. So, Teresa, I've got I've got two reflections. The first one is takes me back 45 years. The first time that I think now, I would say I was doing anything you could say was leadership. I was a campus activist at college and we were organizing um, against apartheid and the investments that our college made in companies in South Africa. The thing that I remember was lack of self-awareness. Like, I don't think that any of us called ourselves leaders we just like did what we were doing together and just kind of did it day by day and kept on and and without that awareness about what we're doing and how we're doing it today i've been kind of startled to realize in the last maybe five to ten years how important training is in leadership and how i would say that i just didn't give enough attention and credit to the, the super importance of ongoing training for new employees. Like I was always good working with someone who was a self-starter, who could make it all happen, teach themselves things, and, and didn't appreciate how vital a, a really solid training program is for the whole thing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Angel and Michael. What an incredible journey you both have taken personally and within this organization. Many triumphs, failures, tears, and joy. What is next for Red Tomato? What do you see as the next iteration of this organization? 
Right now, I feel like, you know, my my work in here is I've been here 20 something years. Like I said, I want to I want to be able to sit on the porch and drink some coffee and see us still stirring things up in food systems. And so my job is to really uh, continue to kind of build our capacity and build our strength against the current challenges we see out there in the marketplace continue to foster and like support my team um, and their growth and kind of just kind of can really the where my head is at is I'm bridging this organization into the future. So continuing to institutionalize the things that me and Michael have in our heads, continue to build those systems and get things on paper and continue to I tell Michael when I'm joking, I say, uh, if Michael looks at me like I'm crazy, but I say, I got to get this organization on autopilot, you know? So it's like, so that's where I'm working. I'm, uh, we're, we're, we've got a lot of our uh, real intense marketing work around our eco, uh, our eco Apple uh, work and, and our bypass work, our programmatic work and food systems change. But really the goal for me is just to keep us here so that I feel like the pro the work that we're doing and and the service that we're giving growers is never ending. Um, and so I just want us to be here for for a long time. Do you, know, you want to add anything, Michael? I would say that um, one insight in in so i'm I'm doing a lot of my work in this eco certified area right now, and one insight has really been that, we need to elevate the voice of the growers themselves and have that voice be the voice of farming, the voice of eco-certified, the voice to the eaters. And um, so harvesting even more out of the farmer networks and bringing more and more farmers, even from different regions now, we're working outside the Northeast and having them see the power that they have when they work together. That's something going on right now. Yeah, I love that. It kind of fits into our theme that community makes the food system, right? It's hmm. elevating everyone's voice. There's so many key players in the system that um, stories are so important to the work that we do. Um, so now I'm going to lead um, the question and answer section. So if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat. And then we will ask Angel and Michael. So the first question we have here is from Christine James. For both Angel and Michael, how did COVID impact Red Tomatoes bypass work? So many community-based groups became food sourcers, aggregators, distributors, pretty much overnight as the pandemic set in. I'm guessing the Bridgeport and Hartford groups Red Tomatoes work with were the front lines of food distribution during this period of their communities. Did COVID's interruption of the conventional slash big food system create greater momentum for bypass or did the pandemic interrupt bypass too? So a couple of questions there to unpack. So how did COVID impact Red Tomatoes bypass work and did COVID's interruption of the conventional slash big food system create greater momentum for bypass or did the pandemic interrupt bypass? Yeah, and good questions. I don't. You know, COVID, I, I don't see it like we, it didn't interrupt our work. I, we we kept the program running um, in Connecticut and it actually supported uh, some of our work with uh, the launch of the local food promotion assistant grants from the USDA after COVID um, to, to procure uh, food from local growers at fair prices, allowed more participants to come into the bypass program. And Red Tomatoes supported our, our community food distributors, as we do, as we show up in the food system as a regional food distributor, coordinating and aggregating uh, produce from multiple family farms and bringing them directly into like the food pantries and community food distributors. So it just, it, it kind of, uh, what COVID, the results of COVID kind of enhanced um, some more support to bring more participants in that had dollars to spend with local growers, but had to figure out the supply chain systems to execute. And so that's that's kind of where we ended up. Michael, would you add anything to that? Well, only that, you know, if you remember back in what Angel said about 2002, when we became a non-asset-based distributor, one of the main reasons was to be agile, flexible. And at, there were points in the early days of COVID where we were kind of amazed at how little you know, that like supply chains were falling apart all over the place. 
and it was rather easy for Red Tomato to keep on playing its normal role by having everybody work from home. And that mm -hmm. was kind of a reassuring discovery. Yeah, that part. Yeah. And I guess I'd say that having remind, Michael reminded me that we're non, you know, with the non-asset base, uh, part of the strength of Red Tomato was the fact that uh, we had built long-term distribution partners uh, relationships with uh, long-term relationships with distro partners that uh, that were right there. If there were price changes, they were discussed, but they were right there and kept on a reliable distribution of produce for us. Yeah. And then I have a question from Eric DeLuca. I see this trend repeatedly these days, how current leaders with a long track record at an organization can build a sustainable relationship with founders in sidesteps founder syndrome or the anxiety of influence. Also, I love to hear Angel talk about value chain relationships moving at the speed of trust. So there's two questions there. <laughs> yeah. So I'll repeat it again. How current leaders with a, a long track record at an organization can build a sustainable relationship with founders that sidesteps founder syndrome or the anxiety of influence. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with that one. I think, um, I mean, for me coming into this, I've been working with Michael, you know, we've been working together for like 20 years. I've learned so much from Michael and being here. And uh, and I, 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 I seen a lot of his vision and the work around the work that we're doing in eco. And so coming in as an executive director, feeling like, okay, I, I come from operations. I got the rest of all this stuff, but there's still a whole nother half over here that I need support on. So um, I just felt like it's, I want to keep the guy as long as I can keep him because, <laughs> because there's so much other places that the founder with their experience have been unable to contribute to because they've been doing other parts of the organizational work. And if I can free up and get the best uh, contribution from the founder, that's kind of, that was, that's always been, and, and I, you know, and I'm building, the way I've always came into Red Tomato is that, yeah, this is a, I'm, I'm, I wanna, it was important to me to build, to continue to build the legacy that uh, that Michael kind of put out here. And having them be a part of that is like, it's been, it's, it's, I wouldn't have it any other way, but figuring out how to do it well is, is what uh, the love has given me the patience to figure out how to do it well um, and, and humble myself when things, uh, when things get tough. So that's, I, I think I'd answer that question. If that answers that question. And then, that's the second, yeah. huh? and then the second one was, if you could talk about the value chain relationships moving at the speed of trust. Yeah, we've, I've been in some, yeah, we, uh, so what we realize in, you know, collaboration is hard. Um, every, it's part of why we, I mentioned that we hired a, a, a consultant to work with us and bring methods for effective collaboration. And, and so things, things really move at the speed of trust, but, uh, and that's kind of where I, where it really comes from is when we're thinking about, uh, building new relationships or in collaboration with folks um, that have had uh, bad experiences in the past. It's like we we build in the trust is at the at the at the speed of trust. If we build the trust first, we can start to think more, but collaborate more, work closely, explore more, and figure things out. But we can't just jump into it. Um, it just usually doesn't work that way. And so that's kind of part of what it takes to work with growers and produce and food systems. There's a lot of personal relationships, uh, interpersonal relationships that can't really be removed out of the process, which is why technology is having a hard time trying to collapse this supply chain. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Michael, you talked a little bit about this, but if you could both answer about, you know, you talked about elevating kind of the voice of the farmer uh, what other ways are you guys looking to bring in equity into the work that you do? Big question. Yeah, there's, there's or one. Or want that, to. <laughs> would you say, Teresa? I said, are currently doing or want to do oh, in the future. Well, there, there's one thing that we are currently trying to do and very badly, 
want to do. And that um, focuses on the role of the farm workers. And, um, you know, I think to this group of people, it, it, it really almost need not be said, right? There's no, there's no food system, there's no farm system without highly skilled, incredibly hardworking farm workers who, who, who do it all. And in our orchard world, uh, a lot of that has been H2A workers for a long time. The apple crop is, is harvested largely by H2A workers, but it's not only that. So Can we've you just been... describe what that is? Oh, sorry. It's the hospitality guest worker program that, that runs through the government. And H2A is the agricultural part and H2B is the hospitality sector, restaurants, hotels, et cetera. And, um, and there are all these laws and rules that dictate um, how you have to take care of your H2A workers when they arrive. And that's from the wage to the housing, transportation, blah, blah, blah. So, but, but the thing that, that's really, that we're struggling with here is to how to build a different model of uh, worker management and well-being so that you take away that sense of there are the workers on one side and there are farm owners and the farmers on the other side. And we have partners actually in the West Coast, a group called the Equitable Food Initiative, and um, a consultant who used to um, be a vice president with the United Farm Workers named Eric Nicholson. And then we are kind of building, trying to build a proposal to be funded and a model um, whereby farm workers are in a participatory system where they are recognized and trained for the high skills that they have, where uh, the operation moves in multiple languages and farm workers are honored at, at the table and able to participate in their own language. And where this is not seen as an act of charity, but where this is recognized as a way to increase productivity, to make the farm work better, to make the products better, so that food safety. Um, so that's a huge challenge that we're trying to put together in that in that field. Thank you. Angel, did you want to add anything to that? No? OK. <laughs> um, so we have a question here from an anonymous person. Um, there are a lot of labels out there, Eco Apple, Organic, IPM, GMO, Free, and a lot of other issues that our institutional food service buyers need to consider. Gluten-free, dairy-free, vegetarian, et cetera. Any suggestions for how to navigate the complex waters of buying values-based food? and making sure the story of the values gets to the customer and their customers. Mm. You wanna take that, Michael? <laughs> Thanks, Angel. Um, boy, I feel that one, you know, I mean, I think the number of certifications continues to grow and maybe the most important one that's evolving now is regenerative. And, um, you know, I think that most of them have real meaning and importance behind them. Um, and so at the institutional level, I, I think one has to do some prioritize. Well, actually, if you're an institution, you have to pay attention to the details of gluten-free and lactose-free. Um, but you don't necessarily have to build an educational program necessarily around that. So I feel like there may be levels where at one level an institution really prioritizes what are the values that we want to let the eaters in this institution know that we are really batting for. Like this is who we are and these are the growers that we're trying to, to forefront. And then at another level, there's the, this is how we're going to care for the people who eat here and who buy here. And I think in some ways those two communication jobs can be separated and they're both really important in different ways. Um, but I'm not sure that helped at all. But I think that people do have to make choices <clears throat> about what matters more here, what matters most here. Because you, you can't communicate 10 to 15 things at one time to people and hope that you're communicating effectively. 
You want to add anything else, Angel? It's a hard question. Nothing more to add other than, uh, you know, it's just, I think that all, everybody's intent with the labels is to, to, to make safer, better, you know, it, it's all uh, good intentioned and, and and so there's a purpose behind why all of that stuff exists. And 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 like Michael said, I think you you have to kind of look at this stuff, vet it, and understand what's in what uh if you if you if you feel like you can trust it, then what are the values that you're after? Uh, because there's there's a lot out there. And that's kind of how I look at it. It's vet it and understand which ones you really care about. And if that is in alignment with your values and you feel good about it, then it's good then it's good but there's there's a lot of it happening there's there's some that may be genuine and there's some that might be greenwashing and you got to kind of understand what's what's really going on out there yeah and i would just add and fine is not paying me to say this but tap into your networks and um places like these where you can really network with your peers and just gain a lot of resources and information and i think that's super helpful to know what other people that are doing similar work to you are doing and kind of troubleshooting. Um, so we have another question from Emma Kate Rose, that's a pretty name. Uh, um, have you had to overcome major climate events in supply chains? Is the speed of trust fast enough in the face of these disruptions? Well, I mean, We had I, like I can't think of major climate events that have affected us because we're more moving more of our product kind of is moving more local regional and we're not we're not really going too much state to state other than we're trying to minimize carbon emissions as much as possible by you know picking up and delivering in short distances and the climate change I think is really affecting our growers. Um, when I when I think about supply chains, I think about trucks and operations. But where I really, yeah, where the real where the climate change is starting to affect us, I think is really with extreme changes to weather patterns. Um, and we're starting to like this, for example, this season we may we may not have peaches because of that real deep freeze that we had over here in the northeast, and we we may have some issues with berries. And years before being underwater, um, there was potential disease and harm to vegetables from coming out of that year. So climate is a factor of, of farming and we're, we're kind of, I feel like we're like farmers. We, we go through it every year as well. We kind of, kind of adapt to what's coming. You know, I can, can I build on that a little? Yeah. Um, so a Angel referred to, um, this year's New England peach crop wiped out. And this is the second time in short history where that happened. And so that's pretty hard. So one thing that we've discovered, which is the power of our network. So when, when we've lost entire apple crops, um, more to hail than to freezing, but for both, the, what the growers have said really clearly is that in a relationship with a large customer like a supermarket, when you get wiped out, it's not uncommon for you to lose your connection because that chain has to fill the shelf that year. So they're going to build a new relationship with another grower. They're going to put someone else's apples and you may have been serving them for 15 or 20 years at, at your family farm. But what happens in our grower network is that rather than give up the shelf, we move the supply from one set of growers to another set of growers. And in the eyes of the supermarket, they're still buying from Red Tomato and the Eco Program. And so there's really no visible change there. And the growers who lost their entire crop still hold on to their market space. And um, we've proved what's happened over time is growers are saying that that's increasingly a real benefit to being part of the network. And I think it's. I just wanted to add a little more to that, which Michael reminded me in listening to that, that I think it's a good point uh, to make the folks as kind of part of how we morphed into being more of a regional distributor is kind of uh, being in the marketplace and knowing that order fulfillment uh, was really important to hold in that market share and being reliable 
providing the ease of business. And so part of that meant extending our our reach of in our sourcing so that if we couldn't get tomatoes in the field one morning because it was raining, we could pull them, we could offer the tomatoes from New Jersey or somewhere else in substitute of those while we came back with the local. And so, yeah, that just felt important to point that out as part of how we started to expand our network of growers. Thank you. Now I have a question from Tanya. Angel, you're now in a position to inspire and encourage leadership in others and upcoming leaders. Can you speak to how you are doing that and applying lessons learned along the way to where you are now? Sure. Um, yeah, it's been, I, I, I persevered and came through a lot and I feel like I couldn't fall forward in life if I didn't bring it back and I love helping others. And so part of where I'm, I'm giving back and doing a lot of that work uh, is sharing my lessons learned through, uh, I'm the board chair of the Urban Farming Institute in Boston. Um, I've been uh, sitting on the Rhode Island Food Policy Council, uh, working with them since we came into Rhode Island and uh, sharing a lot of our lessons there. Um, also, uh, I've been for about four or five years of, of food, with the Food Systems Leadership Network, I, I'm lucky to be able to mentor food hubs all around the US and in Puerto Rico and specifically in communities of color. Um, so it's been it's been amazing to continue to find places where to just like continue to share and and not only the lessons learned around business and 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 financial metrics and like strategic planning, but more also lessons learned around just uh being a person of color and navigating uh in a world where uh in a white world where there were less people of color and now more of us are here and so continuing it's been part of my story is that i have to be here to continue to empower others like me to continue to come into these rooms thank you angel and you know as a latina i would add we've always been here right we're the ones growing we're the ones cooking we're in the restaurants we've always <laughs> been here and so i think a big part of the story is also acknowledging um, all the other players that have been doing the work that people often don't see and recognize um, and I just want to thank you, Angel and Michael. I hope you have a chance to read the chat later and all the accolades that are coming in. Your stories are so incredible. They're so powerful, personal, and for your organization as well. It was an honor uh, moderating this. It was an honor meeting you both. And I can't wait, hopefully, to meet you in person um, soon. And I want to thank everyone else, too, for joining in and participating. We hope you all take a minute to fill out the short survey in the chat, and we look forward to seeing you during other sessions during the summit. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and have a great day, and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank you.